the uh, Naval Academy taught very clearly, and it, it's burned in my brain, a midshipman will not lie, cheat, nor steal, nor tolerate those who do. And if you break one of those, you can be immediately expelled from the Naval Academy. The law is the same way. Today on Timelines, we have Craig Mueller, candidate for Attorney General for the great state of Nevada. Craig, welcome to Timelines, and thank you for coming today. You came a long way, all the way from Las Vegas. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. He came from Las Vegas, but he's really here. Craig is here for a forum. Yes, I am. I'm here to address the Washoe County Republican Men's Club. And because you're running for Attorney General at the great state of Nevada. Yes, I am. I've been here for 50 years, and I'd like to... Uh, give a little community service back uh, to the state that's been so good to me uh, before I retire. Yeah, you know, we've got, we're going to ask you about your background, what you did, how you grew up, but I've got a really pressing question. Certainly. How does somebody from a landlocked state like um, Las Vegas out in the desert go to Naval Academy? Well, let me ask you a question. Sorry about that, folks. West Point? If, if, yes, in the Naval Academy. <laughs> if you were a young man who wanted to get as far away from home as you possibly could at 18 uh, from Las Vegas, where would you go? Yeah, go to the East Coast. The East Coast Maryland. and go, I go to the, I, jo- or I, I uh, told my parents I was going to j- run off and join the establishment. I went to the Naval Academy, and there's a song they have there. Uh, it, it goes, for some joined for the love of the service and some joined for love of the sea. I enjoy sea duty and enjoyed sea duty immensely. And if I had been 25 years old forever, I'd have been on the bridge of a ship forever. You know, another thing, it says something, you came back to your hometown. Yes. That says a lot. That means you liked your hometown. Yes, it does. It was, uh, um, I had actually a colorful childhood and uh, I grew up in Las Vegas when there were still farms there. And I actually lived across the street from a pond and a, a stream, free flowing stream. And that's all been unfortunately bulldozed over. I got to ask this question. Where were the farms? We, they were on the east side of the valley. The uh, springs, uh, yeah, know, yeah. uh, the east side, uh, the spring started about where the um, Las Vegas Boulevard at Washington are and they flowed east. And they flow down into Henderson. And those have been, yeah, th- I, uh, that's why it became a, a watering hole on the way west. That's one of the routes that the Mormons, didn't they discover or develop that route? And they, they established the first Las Vegas uh, settlement? Actually, I believe the, spot, the trail was actually on the old uh, uh, Santa Fe Trail. Santa Fe the, Trail, The, okay. the uh, Spaniards had used Las Vegas as a watering hole for a long time. The Los Angeles, San Pedro, and Salt Lake Railroad called Las Vegas Water Hole 29. And they decided because there was so much water in the valley to route the rail lines through the Las Vegas Valley. This is pretty amazing, the water that you did have in Las Vegas. It's not there now, of course. I sort of seen the museums as you drive around. But. No, when, uh, even through high school, we went out to Thule Springs and the water was gushing up uh, cold and clear from uh, the uh, Artesian Springs. Yeah. We used to go swimming there. And that's the start of Las Vegas. That's why it's <clears throat> Las Vegas, why it established. And yes. then it grew from there. We could talk about the history of Las Vegas, interesting place, but let's get back to you. So you went to high school, you went to the academy. Out of the academy, how long were you in the Navy? I did seven and a half years on active duty. Um, I got, I was stationed on the Jewish Fuhrer. I did a tour up on the Persian Gulf uh, during the tanker war. Uh, I came back, we spent a few months in, in, in the coastal uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Then we went down off the coast of Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. We came back and were working up for a second deployment out to the Persian Gulf when they decided our ship needed to be overhauled. And so we went from two months away from leaving for the Persian Gulf to going up to Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Right. Yep. I, I remember that time well. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Yeah, I remember that time well. 91. T- what was that? I was in, we were in the shipyard. Uh, it was in Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. We were in dry dock number two. Uh, it would have been 1987. 87, okay. And I met a lot of very colorful people in South Philly that just didn't exist in Las Vegas. Philadelphia, how long were you in Philadelphia? I was there for a year. That's and nice. I, you got to, get a lot. to this day, we overhauled the ship, and I was uh, got uh, what we called a uh, fleet promotion. I got promoted up to being chief engineer. So I was in charge of an industrial overhaul of 140 men and a $30 million budget. And to this day, I still remember almost all the shop foreman's names that I work with. So were you an engineer at sea too? I was uh, fleeted up to chief engineer. I was qualified as a, a steam engineer on a 1200 pound yeah. plant. I'm a little familiar with that. My son's a Coast Guard Academy grad and he liked the engineering track. Before he went to flight school, he worked that track. No, it's a very interesting job and I love technology and I yeah. love the engineering behind it. And to this day, I, I use a lot of what I've learned. They seem to lo- love it. The engineers I met love their jobs. I was 
took pride of the fact that uh, I could fix almost anything with a little wrench, Balzona, and a welding rig. We could put, and uh, our ship was old and it needed a lot of love, love. So I learned to do a lot of pretty interesting things. So going forward, how did you get from the Navy in the reserve and then to become an attorney? Well, it's a funny story. Um, I got orders unexpectedly out of Philadelphia. Um, they had over toured me a few months, and I, the orders showed up. I uh, uh, was sent to Washington, D.C. in August and sat behind a desk for the first time in my life yeah. and almost uh, exploded. <laughs> I, uh, the pace of being in charge of 140 guys to sitting behind a desk and doing some pretty minimum amount of paperwork uh, didn't agree with me. So I went over to the University of Baltimore Law School, and I walked in, and I went in uniform, and I applied to the dean to start that fall, and he uh, accepted me. So I started law school uh, in September of 87. So at night, while you're working in the Navy, you're going to law school? Yes. They like, the military likes you doing that, by the way. Oh, yes. When no, you have those kind of assignments. It was a wonderful education. I met some spectacularly interesting people. I never dreamed, actually, I would ever complete law school. Uh, but the Cold War was over, and we were going from 600 ships down to 150 ships, so they kept extending me. And then it suddenly dawned on me in 92 that I was actually going to graduate, have a law degree. And uh, 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 so I accepted my diploma. I took the Maryland bar, and I resigned from active duty in uh, 92, went into the reserves. You know, on a side note, because you and I paralleled really close, that was a weird time in the military because I love the military. Mm -hmm. I was in almost nine years of active. And I got out because I felt like our mission was disappearing and that we just didn't need a, a big military. No. It, it felt like we didn't have the mission. The mission was gone. And, and President Reagan left. I loved Reagan as a commander in chief. So did I. I was uh, very impressed. No, I enjoyed the Navy part of the Navy very much. Uh, in the service they have, uh, in the officer corps, they have Washington sailors and Norfolk sailors and uh, guys who like ships and running ships and guys who like politicking and policy. Right. And I was definitely a Norfolk sailor. I enjoyed yeah. ships and I enjoyed the engineering. Uh, and I tolerated the Washington part of it, but it was not my forte. It's nice to visit, but I've worked in Washington, too, on and off, and it's... Well, as a younger Washington. man, I concluded that if I was going to have to be political to get ahead, I could do that in the civilian world, and that brings me to sitting here uh, sitting here at your desk. Well, you're not supposed to be political in the military. No, that's true. But you have true. to be. I tell my son, you know, you might as well shoot to be admiral, because I, I, I saw who made general for my class. Yeah. I hate to, That's not negative, but... I, it wasn't negative, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I understand completely. No, I you like my to, classmates. They're good guys. <clears throat> no, we. Uh, my class was very fortunate. Um, there was a bloodbath from 03 to 04. Yeah. Our selection rate uh, was 25%. I saw that coming and got out of active duty uh, a month or a year or two before that. But the guys who survived that Did real blood well. watershed, we ended up uh, in my class having the highest percentage of our classmates as admiral. I have a, yep. even to this day, I have a, a classmate of mine, Phil Sayer, is, uh, is, is Commander in Chief Pacific Fleet, four star. There's, because of the war and everything that just happened after 9 11, there was a lot of new billets, and both our classes made more stars and, right. and flag officers than any time in history. No, and that's the thing about if you're going to be a professional military officer, you need to know history because right. sometimes you're in the right place and sometimes you're in the wrong place, and I was in the wrong place. 1915, 1918 was the last time that they had, they caught World War I as young officers and then World War II. Two as senior officers, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that was, uh, we finished the Cold War and there was nothing to be done for 20 years. Well, that we're going to take a break. Okay. We're going to come back to your life and success principles. Certainly. This is Bill, and I want to thank the Silver Sponsors for their financial support for the videos as well as our podcasts. The first person to support us uh, as Silver Sponsor was Ed and Georgette Strom, then Ray and Carolyn Rocha. Other sponsors are U.S. Nuclear Energy Foundation and Gary Duarte. My wife, Karen, is a real estate broker here in Reno, Nevada. Tom Heck for U.S. Senate. Sharon Angle for U.S. Congress, Eugene Hoover for Lieutenant Governor, Brett Jones for Lieutenant Governor, Craig Muller for Attorney General, Wes Duncan for Attorney General, Derek Urar for State Treasurer, Gary Smith, Candidate 16 Senate District, Kim Meyer for Sheriff here in Washoe County, Sherman Box for Sheriff again in Washoe County, Andrew Caldwell for Washoe County School Board Trustee, Aji Shiraji for Mayor of Reno, Eddie Lorton for Mayor of Reno, Washoe County Commissioner Jeannie Herman, Dan Schwartz for Governor, re-elect Mike Clark, Washoe County Assessor. And finally, without their 
support, we couldn't do things like this. We have literally had this month 20,000 views, and that's because of our marketing and support of the uh, Silver Sponsors. And as you can see, um, overall, we've had 124,000 views for the life of it, 736,000 impressions. Impressions is what you see on the side. You'll find these on uh, websites as well as YouTube and Google. Now, without further ado, let's get right into the second half of this interview. So hey, coming back off the break, I got to mention one thing. We're, sure. I think we're at least two, what's the first time, 79, 80 for Army Navy game? Um, I went to the first, <laughs> from a kid from Las Vegas, the Army Navy game made a lasting impression on me. It was 20 degrees. Uh, it was open air stadium in South Philadelphia, Army versus Navy. That would have been the fall of 79. Yeah, we're at the same place. It's cold. We lost. Navy won. Bummer. And um, I was, uh, to this day, I will remember that to the day I die. It was sitting there freezing in a tr oh, my overcoat. Uh, we were passing around a um, flask, <laughs> which was illegal uh -oh. at this time. Well, actually, it wasn't illegal. Drinking age was 18. So actually, yeah. it was legal. It was frowned upon, though. I think that'd be a tough one at the game if you could drink or not. That's like pushing the edges. Yeah, it was push. It was pushing a little bit, but I've never been afraid to bend a few rules when I need to. At least as an officer, I didn't. Um, but yeah, it was a very interesting experience, and uh, I remember it to this day. Yeah, it always is painful. I was my senior year. We lost. Painful. <laughs> good, good job. But you know, Army won last year and won the year before, so that's nice. Yes, and then we'll go back for the last 12 years before that. But, we're, 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 but who's talking? <laughs> so going on, we'll talk about your life and success principles. The first thing you said is discipline. Discipline. Um, I don't. I was a very young boy, uh, sixth grade, playing Pop Warner football. My football coach was recently discharged from the Marine Corps, and he had that experience, had a very lasting ex experience on me. He demonstrated to me the importance of setting goals, sticking with them, and I have been... Uh, that has stuck with me ever since. I believe that fo that Pop Warner football coach is what got me into the Naval Academy and what got me through law school. It's funny. I we have similar. I, I played Pop Warner, but my coach was in high school. It left an impress. My freshman coach is a Vince Lombardi guy. Fifteen minutes early. And you think about Vince Lombardi. He fit. He was at West Point, by the way. He's right. one of the coaches I, there. I do know that. <laughs> the uh, the discipline of of Vince Lombardi. The concepts. Very good. Um, so you, hard work. It fits right into hard work. I have been a workaholic my whole life. I. I I don't know why, but I hate not getting stuff done. My day is ruined if I don't get something accomplished every day. Um, I get up at 5.30 every morning. I'm usually in bed about 10.30 every night. And with the exception of a few minutes here and a few minutes there, it's pretty much constant work. The law is a very, very demanding profession. No client comes in and hires you for a small problem. And no client cares what other cases you have. The only, client, the only thing the client is interested in is the case they've hired you on. So what ha hard work, I'm going to regress here, you're going to run for attorney general when you win, what happens to your practice? I have been very fortunate. I have a recently retired Marine Corps Lieutenant Colonel of the JAG Corps who is, if he were not in my law practice, uh, running would not be feasible. He's a very talented trial attorney and a very talented organizer and he's uh, given me the breathing room to actually spend the time and effort to campaign and very, I'm, I'm very, very, very glad for his help. So going on, your last point was code. Good. The uh, Naval Academy taught very clearly, and it, it's burned in my brain, a midshipman will not lie, cheat, nor steal, nor tolerate those who do. And if you break one of those, you can be immediately expelled from the Naval Academy. The law is the same way. And frequently you're dealing with scurrilous people, both in criminal and civil law. Um, and you have to follow the code of ethics as an attorney, or otherwise you are lost. You can never go from being 100% honest to 99% honest, back to 100% again. If you do anything wrong, you can't get back there again. Yeah. And I have, in 25 years practicing law, I may have made mistakes, I may have missed things, but I've never intentionally done anything wrong. And the, the, the code and the rules and the ethics are absolutely essential in this line of work. Very good, very good. I think that's something we definitely have in common with academies. You, you don't make it through academy without a code. No, sir. Period. It's, it's of, just feel, part of the job. You don't realize how tough it is to get in now. It's tougher than ever now. My, my daughter's in the process. And I'm not sure I would get in today. I don't think I would either. I don't know, but I'd probably end up going. I was going to go PLC, platoon leaders class for Marine Corps, for Marine pilot. Um, but well, it, it way it works out. Well, I was, uh, didn't have a lot of support. I didn't have a backup plan. If I didn't get into the uh, service academy, I, was, uh, I don't know what I would have done. I'm sure you'd figure something out. Very good. So 
we're going to go and talk about your campaign a little bit. Certainly. That's a big thing. It's the first time you've run. Yes, it is. I see a lot of you. You're running a good campaign. Thank you. You did it really well. Um, I, I've watched you on your YouTube channel. You, you speak well. I like your points. So in the campaign, what are some of the challenges you're running up on right now? Well, the campaign is a couple of things. Number one, it's a very steep learning curve. You have lots of friends who are offering you lots of advice. Most of it, if not all of it, very well meant. But the reality is, is it's still your campaign and there's a lot of opportunities to make mistakes in, uh, when you first get started. Um, I've been aided in the campaign because I have a pretty strong view of what the world is and how, how, how the law should work. And unlike a lot of other candidates, I'm running for an executive position. I've been an executive for 25 years running my own law practice, and I'm running to do the same line of work that I've been in all along. So I don't have to say things like, I think, or you know, we should. I can say stuff like, I did, and last time I handled a case like that. So that has made it a lot easier. Um, I'm a very strong, strict constructionist of Constitution, and I believe courts should follow the Constitution and the written law. If the law doesn't work, then the legislature is there to change it. It is not a judge's or lawyer's job to rewrite the law for the legislature. Um, I have over and over again supported the Second Amendment. I've supported the First Amendment. I've been in front of the Nevada Supreme Court numerous times on First Amendment cases. I've also been up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in for, uh, uh, enforcing a uh, right to trial by jury, and I won a case there. So um, I have a very strong view of the Bill of Rights um, uh, and how the law should actually be enforced. Very good. Now, how does your family take it? I'm looking at your website right now, which I, is craigfornevada.com, right? Yes, yes sir. And it, there's a picture. Of your, that's your family, I take it. Yes, it is. Those are my, uh, my wife and my younger son and daughter. Very good. And some other folks here helping you out? Those are two of my uh, law firm employees. That's the Very campaign good. kickoff on the steps of the Clark County Courthouse last November. Seems like eons ago already. Small, small start and it grows and grows. That's a very good looking family. Oh, thank you. I'm blessed to have a very loving and supportive wife and uh, two kids who uh, uh, seem to be uh, on board. Boy, girl, how old are they? Uh, Elizabeth is 11. She's in sixth grade at Henderson International. And William is in uh, 10 and he's uh, in fifth grade at Henderson International. Very good. And uh, he's going to go to Naval Academy? Uh, that's what he and says she? this week. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my daughter seems more uh, more inclined to the academy sort of temperament. Yeah. You know, that's you got to think about that. And they look at that. My, again, my family is going through that now. I've got two daughters. Very good. So how are they taking the campaign again? Well, I get, a, get some complaining about not being home as much uh, yeah. as, as I have been in the past. But the law is demanding, and uh, being away from home, unfortunately, is part of the job sometimes. What happens when you get elected? Are you up here or you travel more? Well, if I'm up here, there's a, as we're all aware, there's a state building down in Las Vegas uh, at Las Vegas Boulevard at Washington, uh, back in where it used to be Fantasy Park when I was a kid. So there, I can work uh, out of the uh, Las Vegas office, but it is my plan. If I'm elected, I'm going to run the attorney general's office like I ran the Navy. I'm going to walk around a lot. I'm going to be everywhere all the time, moving around. I'm not going to sit behind a desk and get shoveled paper and information. Lead from the front. Uh, I am going to lead from the front. Yeah. It is my desire to actually try cases as your attorney general. Oh, cool. I actually go into court um, and, and represent them. And that's politically risky because if I botch it, I look pretty <laughs> bad. Um, but Stu Bell did that when he was a Clark County District Attorney, um, and I thought that that was a wise policy. And the reality is, is law is a trade as well as a learned profession. I don't know how you can supervise 160 lawyers if you can't go in the court once in a while and do a cases. The colonel and I were just speaking today before I flew up here. He's got a very difficult case to do next week, and even after 20 years, we had to talk about how to handle things because there's a couple of tough issues in that case. And law is, is there's, it's called the practice of law, and it, with a few gray hairs now, I recognize why. Because no matter how hard you try, you can never learn it all. There's always more to pick up. Very good. So, Craig, how can the listener help you out? Well, my website is craigfornevada.com. I would, A, appreciate your support. And as they say in the astronaut business, no bucks, no buck rogers. So if you would like to make a donation, our website is live. It's Craig www.craig, C-R-A-I-G, for the number four, Nevada, uh, dot com. Um, I've also got my position papers. You will see something, and I want you to draw your attention to this. I have taken specific, hard, and detailed views on issues. I don't want to be the attorney general to run around and shake hands. 
I've got, uh, I'm seeking a mandate from the voters for these policies. And if, if you please look at them and take a, a view of, of my issues, uh, there'll be several more. I've got another, uh, several planned, and we'll get them up in the next few days. But I'm seeking a mandate from the voters for some substantive change. Specifically, I want to reorganize our relationship with the federal government. I want to sue the federal government. I want to get the BLM out of our state. And I believe that we can never be a, a full state in a proper state with the federal government looking over our shoulders. A government based around the Secretary of the Interior as being the most important part a person in a state is simply unacceptable to me. You know, uh, folks, go to his website, go to Craig's website, look at the videos. Uh, I, I look at a lot of websites. You've used your videos extraordinarily well. I like your positions. And I like how you laid that out. That's a real strength. And you get to know you, too. If you want to know the candidate, watch his videos. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm 57. I'm not, I can't be a career politician if I want to. I don't have enough time left. I've been a career lawyer. I want to do a good job for my state, and I want to leave it a better place than, than it is now. Well, I got one last tough question. Sure. When I'm in Las Vegas, where do I eat? I liked the Bavarian Cafe. It was, uh, I um, um, taught myself German. Ich studiere Deutsch in mein Auto. As I was commuting to and from work. It is a small uh, German food restaurant at the corner of Sunridge at um, Eastern. Okay, and very good. I was trying to look it up, but that's good. I, I, I actually eat at these places. When I go to Vegas, I always eat where somebody says to eat. Well, they are a retired German couple. They literally flew over from Essen and opened a restaurant, and that's their retirement job. That sounds good. Which strikes me as an awful lot of work for retirement, there, but they do a wonderful job. You know, I don't want to ramble, but Las Vegas has what a culture, different culture. They have people from all over the world live there. There is fascinating things because Las Vegas is the most ethnically diverse yeah. city in the country, and nobody even talks about that. No, people don't realize that. And there's the, of, of wealth classes, too. Oh, there's a all lot of wealth and all sorts. Of, you know. No, Las Vegas is, is becoming a very different place very quickly. As a aside, just a general aside, when I was a child here, there was 300,000 people in the whole state, and almost all of them Scotch-Irish. Yeah. Okay? And I was, I was the German kid with a name like Mueller. And that was true. That was in the 70s. My coach was still calling me the German kid. Um, having said that, the state's now 3 million, and with this tax code we're gonna, uh, in California, we're going to go to 4, 5 million pretty quick. Yep. A lot of Californians, a lot of people from around the country come here just for the tax benefit. Well, now the practical problem we have in Nevada, and especially in southern Nevada, is we need to reorganize our government. A government for 300,000 people is not a government for 3 million people, and it's certainly not going to work very well for a government of well, 400,000. When you win your primary, you come back, and let's talk about that. Absolutely. More detail. Thanks, Craig. All right. Thank you. Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead and, if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. And go over here, watch a couple more videos. Link to our website at republicanmenstclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.